to the public in order to address a matter pertaining to B, personnel matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal and local board employees, applicants to boards, commissions, and committees. That was carried and the meeting was held. As a reminder that the meeting is live streamed and recorded and available on the internet by visiting the town of Perry Sound website at www.perrysound.ca. And at this time, I'd like to also acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people under the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850 and uh, the Métis that traveled the waterways of our region. And are there any, is there any prioritization of the agenda? Uh, I'll also remind everyone that Councillor Borneman and Councillor Ashford are online tonight. Um, is there any prioritization of the agenda additions? No? Okay, may I have a mover and seconder then? Yeah. Councillor Bolesky and Councillor McCann, that the council agenda for December 6, 2022 be approved as circulated. Uh, all in favor? That's carried. Any disclosure pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof? Councillor McCann? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I believe, uh, I just had it, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, item number 922, uh, 41A Isabella Street. I'll go claim a conflict of interest there because the property owners are personal friends. Okay. All right. Um, minutes. May I have a mover and seconder for the minutes? Councillor McDonald, Councillor Keith, for the minutes from the regular council meeting held November 15th, 2022, and the special meeting held November 29th be approved as circulated. Any discussion or comments on those minutes? No, all in favor then? And that's carried. So at this time, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a few minutes to hold a public meeting to hear. Here we okay to hear any interested persons with regard to a proposed consent application for a lot addition under section 53 of the Planning Act. May I have a mover and seconder to adjourn this portion of the meeting, Councillor Bolesky and Councillor McCann. That we do now adjourn the regular meeting, declare the public meeting open. All in favor? That's carried. Ms. Johnson, could you explain how the public was notified of consent application B22-15 for Hassel Holdings Incorporated? Yes, Your Worship, notice was given by prepaid first class mail to the required prescribed agencies and property owners within 60 meters and posted on the property. Notice is therefore considered to be provided in accordance with the Planning Act. Thank you. Mr. Rand, could you explain the purpose of the proposed consent application? Thank you, Your Worship. The subject lands are located at 37 Joseph Street and have frontage on Joseph Street, Perry Sound Drive, and Gibson Street. The application was submitted in order to facilitate a lot addition to recognize an existing driveway encroachment at 153 Gibson Street. Staff would note that the applications conform with the intent of the town's official plan and complies with the town's zoning bylaw. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. In accordance with the plan, Matt, Council will consider all matters placed before it prior to granting a consent. If a person or public body who files an appeal of decision of a decision of the Council of the Corporation of the Town of Perry Sound in respect of a proposed consent does not make written submission uh, to the Council before it provides or refuses to provide a provisional consent, the Ontario Land Tribunal may dismiss the appeal. At this time, does anyone wish to speak in favor of the proposed application for consent?
No, say not. So since no one's speaking in favor, is there anyone that wishes to speak in opposition to the proposed application for consent? Nope. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rand, have there been any letters received as a result of this notice? No agency correspondence has been received as a result of the public notice. Um, we did receive a piece of correspondence from a neighboring property owner, uh, Laura Tripp, who stated the following. The photo provided by the town through the mail with the purpose of informing neighbors of the location of the land in question relative to the abutting properties is inaccurate and therefore unintentionally misleading and leaves us with questions that are yet to be answered. Given the neighboring residences, residents do not have a clear, accurate location and depiction of where this parcel in question is located, the purchase should not be permitted to pass at this time until accurate information is made available. The photo provided by the town depicts the inaccurate location of the property lines, and as a result, it shows the land to be severed as west of the property belonging to 149 Gibson. If this photo was accurate, it would mean that the northwest section of my property, which currently has access to the road, would then be blocked by land proposed to be owned by 153 Gibson Street. It is, it is reasonable to request clarity and accurate information before proceeding, and I am requesting the following that a member of the town staff come to the property and physically show us where they believe this land to be severed is, to be informed of the source of the photo image with drawn property lines that was mailed to us, and to await a survey confirmation of property lines. I believe it is reasonable to ask that council delay a decision on the matter until an independent survey is obtained, which abuts the property lines in question, and no other correspondence was received. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I have a mover and seconder that we declare the public meeting closed. Councilor McCann, Councilor Keith, all in favor? That's carried. Public meeting's closed. Okay. Uh, any questions of staff? Councilor McCann. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is for Mr. Kearns, and I gave him lots of advance notice that I'd be asking about this tonight. So we've been asking about enhanced lighting at the uh, intersection of Bowes and Pine Drive and about extra street lighting on Queen Street. Um, you had some good news for me. I'm hoping you can share that with us and maybe provide a, a timeline or an expect time of expectation when uh, you can flip the switch. Yeah. Certainly, through you, Your Worship. Um, so certainly with uh, Bows and Pine Street, we have ordered, uh, first of all, specified and ordered the equipment, as well as ensuring that it can actually work where we uh, proposed. So what we're intending is a center uh, installation of a light at that intersection of Bows and Pine that will feed in both directions into both lanes of travel um, to enhance the lighting in that particular intersection. Uh, Queen Street is a little bit more of a challenge, and that's something we'll have to work through uh, the 23 budget process because there is a lack of infrastructure in place to support traditional lighting. So we have to look at some alternatives there. But the Bows and Pine Street uh, is has been ordered and is scheduled for install as soon as the as all the uh, parts arrive. Uh, great, thanks. That, that is good news. So I, I'm sorry. Uh, so time of expectation then is still uh, not putting you on the spot, but it's still uncertain, I suppose, in terms of when the stop is here and able to be installed. Uh, through your worship. Un unfortunately, we're still experiencing all sorts of uh, interesting delays. Um, specific dates are very hard to obtain. Everything has been ordered. I have not heard that anything has been back ordered. So I would anticipate before the end of the year. Great, thank you very much. Okay, okay. Councilor Borneman. Thank you, Your Worship. This question is actually probably for you or Mr. Harris, maybe the two of you. Uh, as everyone's aware, we had a pretty significant power outage last Wednesday evening within the town of Perry Sound. We've had prior conversations about Lakeland um, providing or stationing a crew here, that 
doesn't seem to be in their uh, in their plan. We've discussed with them um, the possibility of entering into some sort of contractual arrangement with Hydro One in the event of emergency, uh, you know, fires and outages and whatnot, where they may need support in order to uh, either shut off or reinstall power more quickly. So I I'm not sure where that one stands. Uh, it's my recollection that we haven't um, met, had a deputation with uh, the Lakeland management team for probably two and a half to three years, uh, certainly prior to COVID at some point. So if, if, you're, if we are not aware of these things, I think it's incumbent upon us to ask them to appear before council and provide us with some updates to these these questions is there an arrangement with hydro one what what how do our frequency and an outages of power outages compare with uh those that are happening in bracebridge and huntsville i think we owe it to the folks in this community especially with the more severe weather that we've been experiencing some answers as to the state of the union with respect to uh, hydroelectricity in Perry Sound. We can, we can, we can certainly ask them for, to come to a meeting. I think that would, I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think we, it's, if we did. It's, it's the only question. answer. Yeah. It puts the onus on them rather than on, on staff to be, conveying issues back and forth, your worship. Yeah. I know the message that I had received because I did ask that night and and you know, I was getting updates was that my understanding was is that there was a crew here to assess, but a forestry crew was needed. And because of the way the tree fell on those, uh, that, that grid of, of power, uh, on on Church Street, that they had to very delicately assess how they were going to remove the branches, so that the tree could actually be pulled away from from the uh, the power grid. So uh, it and because it was a really bad night, getting the forestry crew here was a bit of a challenge. So that took took some time, from my understanding. Is it an excuse? No, it's not. But it's something that they need to work on that we've got people i think closer by um to be able to um, assess the problems and deal with them instead of uh, having to pull people in from other places so i think a deputation from them would be warranted so that council can ask some questions we can do that please mr harris uh, certainly i will uh, make that request okay good any other questions of staff? No? Okay. All right. Correspondence, Ms. Johnson. Your Worship, we have three items of correspondence. The first is from the Chair and Vice Chair, Lynn Gregory and Art Coles, respectively, of Belvedere Heights Board of Management. Their letter is addressed to all Belvedere Heights Municipal Partners, uh, advocating that with the issues before the Belvedere Heights Board, um, that uh, there be some board continuity in terms of appointments and that council consider the, pot the potential of a non-council member or citizen appointee with certain skills and abilities to carry forward the agenda of the, the Belvedere Heights Board of Management that they're currently working on. The second item is a news release from the Founders Circle. The Founders Choice Award winners are announced. Uh, that was on November 11th. The winner of the first place $10,000 award, award is Wade Weir from Wave Fiber Mill. And the second is Steve Hagen from Dent Bay Bakery. The third item of correspondence is from the West Prairie Sound District Museum. And it is the museum's annual request for a contribution from the town this year in the amount of $43,000. And that's been forwarded to the Director of Finance for consideration under the budget process. 
Okay, thank you. Next are deputations. And our first deputation tonight is uh, Keith Duncan and Julie Armstrong regarding concerns with backyard hens. I guess in addition to the group is Tim Thomas, so <laughs> welcome. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, the button should be on the top, a purple button, I believe. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor McGarvey and uh, Council for considering our uh, deputation tonight. Um, so I'm here with some of my uh, local homeowners from uh, the Kristen Heights neighborhood. Uh, we have uh, Tim and, and Julie, because uh, we have a, a grave concern we want to bring forward to, to council for consideration uh, this evening. <clears throat> so a little bit of background here, as uh, everyone uh, um, at, at council is aware, the, the HEN bylaw 2021-7164 uh, was passed on September 10th, uh, 2021. Uh, which uh, permitted residents now to be able to keep backyard hens if they were able uh, to meet the requirements of the bylaw. And our request tonight um, is for, uh, for council, council to repeal the bylaw of, of 2021-7164. Uh, so a, a bit of background here. Um, so town staff acknowledged in a report on September 7th, uh, 2021, that this was a contentious issue. Um, during the public consultation, 15 letters were received in op opposition, 13 in favor, and one from an agency just provided a general comment. So with that being said, obviously, over 50% of the response were in opposition of this. Some of the concerns raised in opposition were the health risks to communities, such as salmonella and E. coli, ticks. Um, secondly, was the lack of available veterinary care for, for said backyard hens. Uh, the third was uh, noise and noxious uh, smells. Um, as well, predators such as coyotes, foxes, and bears were identified as, as, as concerns, rodents, and also uh, property value if you would live in uh, the general vicinity of a, of a backyard uh, hen coop. Um, so a bit about kind of our neighborhood. Um, so numerous uh, neighbors uh, have stated uh, that prior to backyard hens being introduced to our civic neighborhood on Kristen Heights, predators were not a concern. Since the backyard hens were introduced to our neighborhood a few years ago, the fallen predators have been active in our neighborhood on a regular basis. Bears, such as sows, boars, and cubs, coyotes, foxes, raccoons, fishers, all extremely dangerous predators in our neighborhood on a regular basis. So, in terms of attracting predators, you know, they're typically, you know, drawn in by food, available food sources. In talking to the homeowners in our neighborhood, all of our homeowners have attested to the following, that they all keep household garbage slash recycling in their garage. Everyone in our neighborhood has a garage and their recycling and garbage from their household is kept in it. Also, bird feeders are not available during the non-winter months. All residents bring their bird feeders in during these non-winter months. Thirdly, all barbecues are regularly maintained and cleaned. And lastly, our yards are maintained of any sort of available food sources. So there is pride in ownership here. 
really the only variable here has been the hens, which have been available 24 seven since introduced to our neighborhood. And this led to a specific incident that I'm gonna talk about in a quick second here. So leading up to the incident in question on October 31st, raccoons and foxes were previously observed trying to bake in to said hen coop in our neighborhood. On October 25th, a sow or boar was observed lingering in our neighborhood, which the MNR, town bylaw, and OPP were subsequently contacted about. With that being said, six days later, there was a, a, a pretty big incident that occurred. Um, so on the afternoon of October 31st, a sow broke into a hen coop located at 11 Christian Heights and killed one of the hens within inside the coop. That evening, the same sow broke into the coop again and killed four more hens. That sow, after killing those four hens, then tried to break into the homeowner's garage where the hen feed was stored. So here, here's a picture that's been taken by a neighboring homeowner that shows the sound question on August 31st, it, extremely, you know, aggressive as she was just about to break into said head coop. As a result of this bear, or sorry, this sow being on this homeowner's property, an acquaintance of the homeowner shot the sow twice with his rifle as she was trying to escape up her tree to her cubs. As a result of this, the sow was killed. As a result, two cubs were orphaned, and these cubs for the next few days frantically roamed our neighborhood without the guidance of their mother until MNR was able to live trap them. And here's a picture of the cubs taken by, or sorry, a cub, I should say, taken by a neighboring homeowner the day after um, the, the sow was, was shot and killed. So bears. They are known to be aggressive towards humans when either A, they're surprised, B, they're eating, or C, with cubs. With that being said, all three elements were present during the August 31st incident. Also, Kristen Heights, if you're not aware, has an extremely dense brush line on both sides of the street, which provides very good cover for bears, which is a huge issue. So, as a result of this incident on August 31st, there is a number of concerns that have been raised, that have raised. First, a rifle was fired in the dark in a residential neighborhood. That is extremely, extremely problematic. What if said individual missed the intended target and let's say a bullet hit a pet, hit a residence, or heaven forbid, hit a human being? We are in a residential neighborhood, and this was not late at night. We're not talking two in the morning. We're talking like eight, nine o'clock in the evening. So there are still pets out. There's still people out. And the most concerning thing is Julie's grandchildren were less than 20 feet away from when this transpired. How do you explain this to a child? Why are the gunshots happening more or less in my backyard? Extremely, extremely problematic. Secondly, the potential liability for the homeowner and also the town. What if, you know, the, the homeowner who had, you know, fired at the bear missed and hit, you know, someone else's personal property or hit, you know, heaven forbid, you know, an, a, a, an animal or a human being, you know, with that being said, that homeowner and that individual will be liable and also the town will be liable because the town has approved the bylaw to have the hens here in the first place. As a result of all of this, there were homeowners displaced for days over the fears the cubs were roaming the neighborhood. You know, we had two cubs that were frantically roaming the neighborhood. You know, this was extremely dangerous for all residents. Also, a fellow boar then came into the neighborhood at the same time as well. As well as this, family and children were very fearful to go outside during this period of time. And I'm going to turn it over to Tim really quickly because I've done enough talking at this point. <laughs> well, thank you for allowing me to come here tonight. I hope everybody can hear me. Mm -hmm. I'm here because of my heart. This summer, I had grandkids age two and four. <clears throat> I became very nervous about taking them outside. 
I live at One Kristen Heights, and I've been there since 2001. Over the years, we had the odd fox run through. One year, we had a bear eat some apples and then left. When the chicken uh, coop came, suddenly I noticed more foxes, and some of them were very, very sickly looking. There was coyotes, there was a fisher, and there was a small slinky kind of an animal that came in there as well. I, I don't know what it was. But then uh, I got real nervous when this situation ar arose with the uh, sow and her cubs. Everyone in this room has no doubt experienced some kind of a tragedy. A family member, friend, somebody you know has had a heart attack, has cancer or a stroke. And it's a tragedy, but some tragedies are preventable. If you don't drink and smoke and eat properly, you might not experience some of these problems that people have. I feel in my heart that if we're gonna have chicken coops in this town, someone, and I am absolutely certain about this, someone is gonna get mauled by a bear because of their, what they're, they're all about. You surprise them, they guard their food and they have cubs. This situation and having hen uh, coops in town is a preventable thing for someone getting hurt. Now, in my lifetime, in my career, I was fortunate enough in my law enforcement career to finish the last half of it here in this community. I love this community. I am the third generation of families living here. And our daughter is happy to live here as well. Not only do we have kids and grandkids and everything in the neighborhood, to the west of where we live, there's a fitness trail between the condos in the salt dock and where we live. People walk up and down that all the time. The bears have to cross that or come down through the woods to get to where all this stuff is happening. So in my life, I live by black and white, yes or no. And I'm here right now from my heart to say, we do not need chicken coops in this town. Someone is going to get hurt, and I'm absolutely certain about that. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi. I want to say I'm very nervous. Okay, I'm just going to read a little bit of what I wrote. <clears throat> August 31st, 2022, a bear with her two cubs killed one of the chickens at 11 Christian Heights. My daughter lives next door. When my daughter told me what happened, I knew the bear would be back. Obviously, so did the residents living at 11 Christian Heights. Sure enough, she came back with her babies. She killed another four chickens, leaving one alive. There was a lot of noise at the 11 Christian Heights. She was afraid. As she tried to escape to where her babies were, up in a tree, she was climbing the tree to get to her babies. She was shot twice. This gunfire happened in the dark, approximately 20 feet from where my daughter, her partner, and their two children live. In this day and age, to have your child wakened by gunshots just a few feet from their bedroom was very scary for them. Then to see a mother bear killed outside their bedroom window with her babies making awful crying noises. This has been very traumatic for them all. The bear did nothing wrong. There have been no berries or apples this year, Food was scarce for them. At 11 Christian Heights, there was the chicken food out in the open in their fenced in area so they could feed their chickens during the day. I don't live there, but I'm there every day. I've seen fresh fruit, fruit out there for their chickens. The bear could smell all of this. She was only finding food when she went after the chickens. Chickens, ducks, etc., don't belong in a residential area where it becomes a danger to the residents. It also brings, and neither does discharge, and I'm sorry, with bringing bears into the neighborhood, it also brings a person discharging a rifle in the dark at a bear that could have just been wounded. Then what would have happened? Or even killed a person that happened to be outside. After all of this, my daughter called many times looking for help for the cubs. She finally talked to gentlemen at Bearwise to get help for the cubs. They came, set traps in her yard. She left her house for a few days with her dog so that they wouldn't scare the cubs. It took a couple of days for, to catch the cubs. This has been a very unsettling experience for our family and would not want it repeated next summer. These chickens don't just bring bears, they bring 
other wild animals around like fishers, coyotes, etc. So therefore, I would like to ask you to reconsider letting residents bring in chickens, ducks into residential areas where the consequences can be devastating. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. So in, in terms of license coops uh, within the town of Paris Sound, there are currently two licensed coops. One is only active at this point in time with hens. So with that being said, our request of, you know, repealing this uh, bylaw would not impact that many homeowners that currently have chicken coops, but it would have a lasting impact on a community of 7,000 plus. These farm animals are attracting predators in a residentially zoned area, which homeowners are not equipped to deal with. So our request today is we are asking council to take necessary steps to protect the members of our community, especially our children, by repelling the by the hen bylaw 2021-7164. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions for many of the council members? Councilor McCann. Thank you very much. All three of you presented a good case. Um it's it's it is going to be a tough call because uh, you never can please everybody all the time. But I, if it's interesting, your comment about how many coops are uh, active coops in Perry Sound? Do you know that we have? You you say just one in your area or the whole town? Um, I, I talked to uh, Allison in Bible, and she confirmed that there are currently two licensed coops in the entire town, with one being active. Okay, so that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, if council takes another look at this and reconsiders it um, and went with some sort of a decision that uh, sort of grandfathered in the liberty for those who already have them with the idea that once their chickens were gone or died, that was it, rather than sort of walk in and say, you've got to get rid of them. Is that something that you, you know, that would be worth considering if, uh, is that something your group would consider? What's the point of leaving a chicken for well, a day or two how, or a year? It, it's a problem and it's preventable. Well, I guess what I'm saying is that that when, when the how how long does a chicken live? <laughs> I, 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 I'm not a veterinarian, so I. I, yeah. I, 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 I but, you know, I think if, we're into. A, if, if, I guess what I'm just trying to say is, rather than walk in and say you've got to get rid of your chickens, just you know, if they would just if they died out at some point and then that's it, rather than keep the stock alive. Like, if if, if I may, we know the chicken coop in our neighborhood is inactive at this point in time. That's the coop that does not have active chickens in it. So, if we want to be self-serving to our own immediate neighborhood needs, we would be agreeable to that. But looking after the community as a whole, we still have an active coop in the area, which would drive bears and predators to it still. So we want to protect the entire community, just not our immediate neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. No, I understand. Okay, thank you. I'm just throwing an idea out there. I, I appreciate it. There's always lots to consider, always lots of moving parts. Thanks. Councillor Keith? Yes, uh, I'm going to move that uh, we bring this matter back to council for another um, look at the matter, but I would also, in moving that, I would ask that there be a report from uh, town staff so we can have a better idea and discuss this further. So I am moving it. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to hear what the council McDonald had wanted to ask. Um, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I just had a question if the um, the coop on um, Christian Heights was intending to be utilized again, or are they done, do you know? Um, pure speculation on our behalf, but we've heard through town staff that the intent moving forward was, was to not utilize it for hens, but there was additional information brought forward recently, which town staff has investigated and confirmed that after the chickens were in fact, or sorry, the hens were in fact killed by the sow, the homeowner brought in ducks after that this year. So the way that we collectively look at it is 
a predator won't differentiate between a hen or a duck. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I had. That it? Okay. Councillor Keith and, and uh, Councillor McCann have a motion on the floor to bring the bylaw back for review. So um, all in favor of that? That's carried. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions from that group? No? Thank you very much. Thank the you. clerk would like to get your names and addresses though for yep. um, for, for the record. Actually, we give them a piece of paper. And they'll just bring a piece of paper and a pen and yeah. Oh, Jeremy's got one there, Rebecca. You got, you got one, Rebecca. Yeah, Jeremy provided just a blank page. Yep, 100%. Thank you. You've got your flash drive? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> no, that that's that's your guys. I got it. Yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. I can't remember. They probably have to. They have to acknowledge upkeep and everything. So they are supposed to be monitored. Okay. Our next deputation is Nora Alexander regarding petition regarding Wabick Street Forested Area. Uh, uh, oh, the, the microphone. Yeah, there you go. I have a folder for each counselor and your worship. And your worship, your folder contains original petition signatures, my original deputation letter. May I distribute them now? Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nora Alexander. I live on Baycrest Drive, Mayor McGarvey and elected council members. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening regarding the proposed official plan amendment for 66 Wabick Street. I sat here on September 20th and addressed our previous council regarding this amendment application. In that address, I provided rationale for opposing the R3 high density development application by DSAB and gave alternative suggestions for development. Since then, I have discovered other important information regarding the land at 66 Wabick Street, and I'm here tonight to present this to you. I speak not only on behalf of my neighbors here this evening, there are quite a few of us, but also on behalf of the 155 neighbors who have signed the petition delivered to you tonight. We are requesting that a preservation area of two acres of the forest currently present on the site be included in the official plan amendment for 66 Wabick Street. Overwhelmingly, this is supported by the neighborhood. 
This request came about after a closer examination of the property led to the discovery that the one hectare of undisturbed forest on its site that exists purely by accident is quite significant. In fact, for the purposes of planning under the Planning Act, this forest is a candidate for the significant woodlands identification found in the Ministry of Natural Resources Natural Heritage Reference Manual for policies of the Provincial Policy Statement. The detailed rationale for this significant woodlands designation is found in your folders. It meets the criteria for woodland size, woodland diversity, uncommon characteristics pertaining to the age of the trees and the size of the native tree species and the habitat of an endangered animal species. This information is confirmed in a letter from an arborist and a letter from a Shwanaga First Nation biologist, also in your folders. Additionally, in your folders are the references to the legislation in Ontario that protects trees. This is, includes legislation in the Planning Act and the Municipal Act. Probably the most important is the legislation in the Town of Perry Sound's official plan itself, specifically under 2.8.6 Natural Features, 2.8.6.1 states that the town is committed to the protection and enhancement of the concept of the urban forest within urban areas with a commitment to maintaining and expanding a tree environment as an integral component of the urban landscape. The steps involved in achieving this request come from DSAB directly. A committee of representatives met with the chairperson of DSAB and five staff members on November 14th to discuss as neighbors their plans for 66 Wabak Street. We described the significant woodland on the property and we asked them to withdraw their application for amending the official plan to R3 zoning. At this point, DSAP asked us to find them six other acres. We remembered the land purchased by town and Carling as the original pool site, and we are asking that you give DSAB six acres of this property, which is within reasonable walking distance of groceries and schools in exchange for 66 Wabak Street. This exchange puts the town in a position to preserve this urban forest. By doing so, we will also be honoring the William Beattie Lands and Timber Company, who gifted this property to the Perry Sound Board of Education in 1963, specifically for the building of a school. In the original deed, the wording describes this land transfer as a gift. This was how communities were formed. Settlers donated land so that communities could grow and develop. Over the years, a kinsman school was built, then a daycare facility, which are both educational uses. Preserving two acres of the forest would ensure a portion of the six acre site continues to be used for educational purposes as per the original instructions. Also in your folders is a letter from Dr. Victoria Smith, who describes how the forest is utilized by neighborhood families and by the community. It is especially important to the daycare center who uses the forest as part of a forest school curriculum. We all did our homework when purchasing building our homes over a decade ago. This land was zoned open space and R1 residential. It is unreasonably unreasonable to drastically change the zoning to R3 high density and exploit this urban forest. The natural side of Perry Sound is why we live here and protecting, planning and investing in our environment is a value we all share. Simultaneously, 
We are aware of the housing crisis and we want to see attainable housing to be added to our existing community in the form of townhomes, semi-detached homes, and walk-up apartments. The neighborhood would like to see the daycare remain and be expanded. The housing crisis was not caused by a lack of land. The climate crisis, however, is partly caused by loss of biodiversity and natural habitats. And so our planning decisions need to find a balance between housing and nature. By trading DSAB, the property on Wabick Street, for another six acres, this balance can be found. The land offers up a place for both. In your election material, several of you expressed environmental beliefs and values. Specifically, Council, Councillor Borneman, you stated that we need to examine all means possible to ensure the health of our environment. Your Worship, Mayor McGarvey, you stated the importance of including the environment in strategic planning. And Councillor Ashford, well, you had me, us, at your Joni Mitchell quote. And to all of you, I respectfully ask that you oversee the conservation and stewardship of this intact urban forest. Your planning decisions have far-reaching consequences and influence the health of our natural systems that future generations depend on. Take the steps needed to preserve two acres of forest on Wabick Street. Some of these trees are easily 100 years old. Finally, to quote Robin Wall Kimmerer, author, scientist, distinguished teaching professor, founder of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, it is an honor to be the guardian of another species. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? Council, have any questions for Councillor Keith? Yes, thank you, Ms. Alexander. I could just uh, have a comment and a question. Uh, the uh, comment, just to start with, I appreciate the information that has been brought forward here tonight. Thank you. And also the um, suggestion that I question was even anticipated uh, until you brought forth here about possible trade, uh, looking at something rather than just saying, no, we don't want it, but without coming up with any kind of a solution. So I appreciate the, the thought that has been put into that. I am curious because I have been over to that property a few times in the fall time looking at it. When I look at that picture, uh, when, when was that photograph taken? So these photographs were taken in the fall. Um, this one taken in the fall and you, summer you can tell the leaves are still green and the one that you saw at the very beginning yes that had the water um so this one here yes. this was taken later in the fall right after we had quite a substantial rainstorm and you'll notice the water the wetness in the property and um so as a biologist i can tell you that in the spring that would be a vernal pool in other words, it would be filled with salamanders and all sorts of organisms that require uh, water in the spring for their development, their growth. Um, this is a this is a like a gift. It's a package of surprise that happened to be sitting there all these years, over a hundred years, uh, purely by accident because the property was donated, given as a gift, and this section of the forest. This just over uh, one hectare um, was left undisturbed, except for the daycare and the community using it. Um, and when you go go in the forest, it's full of trails, uh, has forts in it, and there's a letter from Dr. Smith explaining all the wonderful things that the community uses this forest for. It's quite a beautiful photograph. That oh, was what I noticed, you. and it's quite colorful. Whoever took it. That was taken with my great. iPhone. Uh, looks <laughs> looks wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilor McCann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your presentation this evening. 
Um, You're welcome. I do like the idea of finding an alternative site for the DSAB property. Um, uh, the property that you mentioned in your report, it was purchased by the town of Perry Sound and uh, Carling Township. Uh, at one point, we thought we might be able to build a pool there, but it was deemed that the topography and uh, there's just so much rock and stuff that the expense of building there uh, made it prohibitive. And I'm wondering if DSAP is going to come back with the same argument with regards to that property. Is there another six acres in town that you might have found that might be an alternative uh, uh, to that? Maybe possibly something even closer to schools and shopping. Have you looked into um, that? So, Councilor McCann, it's my understanding that the original property mentioned by town, the town in Carling purchased is 53 acres. So I'm quite certain within that 53 acres, there would be six acres or even perhaps more for DSAB to build their uh, high density uh, subdivision. <laughs> Um, I have driven by this property. It is within walking distance of the Perry Sound Public School, the high school, the proposed new site for the pool, and within walking distance of no frills. 66 Wabick Street is not within walking distance of any of those places. Um, I have walked to no frills from, from our area. It took takes almost all day. And you're walking on places without sidewalks. So really in terms of accessibility, walkability, the property, um, the original property thought of for the pool is a better choice for DSA. And of the 53 acres, I'm quite certain six acres there would be, um, would be able to be able to build the subdivision that they're considering. Well, it's worth looking at and, and trying to be creative and resourceful in terms of, uh, you know, what the remaining acreage and left, I, what the town would, would do or possibly a developer could do. But uh, I just like the idea of an alternative site and the idea of trading off might not be uh, might, might, I, might be so bad. I also want to reiterate that this was DSAB's idea to find them six other acres. And we sat there, the committee scratching our heads, and then we thought, oh, Perhaps this is something to consider. Uh, Councillor Councilor Barnum and then Councillor McDonald. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. This isn't a thank you also, Mrs. Alexander, but this isn't really a question. This is a comment. You know, councils heard sporadically from the DSAB with respect to their plans. I understand staff has had some suggestions for them, but They've been reluctant to engage with us and with the neighborhood, um, or so it seems at least. And it's difficult to negotiate any sort of settlement without putting people in the room at the same time to have a, a fulsome discussion. So I'm in the giving mood this evening. I, I'm hoping council will join with me in suggesting that we invite the chair of the DSAP board and their executive director to a council meeting so as we can open some sort of dialogue with respect to the issues at 66 Wabick Street and potential alternatives. Councilor Borneman, that'd be an excellent idea. Do we have a seconder for that? Council we'll second that. <laughs> Councilor McCann. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, do we need really... I don't, Councillor Ashford. I, I just had one more question for uh, Nora, if possible. Okay. Can Can you hang on one second because Councillor McDonald had a question for. I, for I can for sure, definitely. Sorry, okay. sorry, uh, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so yes, I just had a question. Um, you mentioned in your uh, deputation here that you sat down with DSAB and they <clears throat> asked you to find them six other acres now. Had this been proposed to them, the property um, purchased by the town? So in the meeting, we in the meeting we did say one of the committee members did say, "What about the property that was originally purchased for the pool?" So that was a discussion. I also want to add that um, DSAB DSAB told us a couple of times they weren't 100% sure what they were going to do yet with 66 Wabick Street. 
And three times during that discussion, they mentioned they could sell it after an R3 zoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'd be interested to see um, how open they are to, to looking at a different location. Um, Cause I had seen preliminary drawings of development that they were proposing there. So I was just wondering how far in they were with that project and if they are open to starting fresh somewhere else. So it'd be good probably to open up a dialogue there. Yeah. Councillor Ashford. Uh, sorry, I was, the other question I had was just uh, with yourself and uh, the different people that you are uh, speaking on behalf, is there any kind of palatability to maintaining the forested area, but then maybe sectioning that off um, and having another uh, part of the property still be used for development, uh, kind of like a, uh, a, a uh, not necessarily like a 50-50, but a bit of a compromise space, depending on how that goes, or is it the the whole part uh, that that really needs to be maintained to maintain the forest? Um, so, Councillor Ashford, uh, thank you for that comment, because I've had many conversations with the Ontario Urban Forest Council regarding this urban forest. And the information they gave me was that it needs to be kept intact. If you start encroaching on the edges, taking out trees, then you damage the root structure of the trees behind them. There's no guarantee that much of that forest would, would survive that sort of thing. It would be like, you know, a normal subdivision where you hope the tree left on the front of someone's property is going to last. So we were instructed that um, keeping the urban forest intact is, is the ultimate goal. I can also say that in your folders, there is uh, from the Ministry of Natural Resources a lot of information on the benefits of a significant woodland the benefits far exceed the tree here and there on someone's front yard. Having an urban forest like this, especially within a community, um, provides so much value in terms of protection of the environment. And also uh, the letter from the biologist is interesting. The endangered fox snake um, habitat is in this forest. Now, if it were significant enough, if we could determine that, then, then laws would dictate that it couldn't be touched at all because an endangered species lives there. The letter from the arborist described the healthy stand of beech trees. Beech trees are threatened. It is a perfectly beautiful piece of urban forest worthy of our attention and our conservation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? No. Um, Council Barnum's uh, suggestion with regard to inviting the DSAB to a meeting. All in favor of that? That's carried. Unopposed. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. For your deputation. Yeah. Do you have a flash drive in? Okay. Used to being like this. Yeah, I'll wait till they leave. He's he's fine. I will. <laughs> Mayor McGarvey saw him at the grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> Mayor McGarvey saw him at the grocery store. 
that's true. That's true. Yes, right? but if you have to supervise the person who's buying the groceries, that's not a good sign, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we uh, we need to continue on with the meeting, and we have another deputation. So, if we could have everyone's attention, please. Our next deputation is from Ann Bossart regarding the uh, Tower Hill Gardens update. Welcome, Ann, and thank you, some of your group. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. It has been a while since I reported to you last. Our tenth anniversary at Tower Hill passed without much fanfare. So tonight, I'm going to try to give you a quick overview of the entire decade. Some of you have been with us for the entire journey, but for those of you who are new, I will give you a little background and encourage you to visit our website for the full picture. This is a photo of the garden in September of 2011. Later that year, council designated the garden and its structures as a heritage property. And the following spring, it was agreed that I could get a group of volunteers together to work in the garden under the condition that we do not create more work for town staff nor expect any funding. I have never seen myself as a leader, but I was very passionate about the idea and had been promoting it for some time. So I screwed up my courage, gathered up everyone I could think of, whoops, Wow, that was quick. <laughs> and, and much to my delight, we became the Tower Hill Gardeners. I have taken thousands of photos of the garden over the years, so I could give you a series of before and after photos of how we have transformed this into this, and this into this and this. But 10 minutes passes very quickly. So I will focus instead on the gardeners, what we do in the garden and some highlights of the past decade. So who are we exactly? Right now I have about 20 people on my email distribution list, but about eight people attend a typical workday during the months of May through October. 45 different people have volunteered over the years and only 16 of us live in town. How's that for? regional involvement, cooperation. Five people have been volunteering for all 10 years and eight have put in more than five, but less than 10. And so what do we do? We show up week in and week out, we have shown up for 10 years. According to my records, we put in between 500 and 600 hours in the garden every year. I try to take attendance every week. Once we started, and it was obvious that we could handle the gardening, the first major project we tackled was the Ranger Cabin. It was constructed in 1930 at a cost of $600. The 16 by 30 frame bungalow with kitchen and dining room for the towerman. It was designed by Peter McEwen, taking much care that the building harmonized with the grounds. Although it had been included in the heritage designation, most of the public works staff thought it should be demolished and replaced by a nice picnic pavilion. As those of you who know me can well imagine, I was not cool with the idea. Bill Vincent even showed me the interior to convince me it was a lost cause, but I was not deterred. I knew it could be saved. As a matter of fact, it was much in the same condition as the first bungalow that Joe and I bought. <laughs> When Peter Brown was convinced of that, he had his staff cover the building with a tarp to prevent further deterioration. And despite the fact that he had said no money, he proposed that council put in $25,000 to the budget to save it. Council did, and so the next spring, we began the process of trying to restore it to its original configuration as Peter McEwen had intended. We stretched that money as far as we could, scaring up more volunteers and community donations. By the fall, the cabin had a nice new roof and it was no longer raining indoors. The next phase required more construction ex expertise. We got a real carpenter involved and provided volunteer assistance when needed. All summer long, the cabin crew was scraping and painting. Barbara Fisher found a retired woodshop teacher who built us new shutters with cutouts like the original. That's as far as the funding got us. 
I don't know if the front porch will ever be this inviting as no further funding has been approved. In 2015, we were approached by David and Lynn Gregory about providing a permanent home for the Slater Lilacs, which had been developed and patented by Lynn's father. With their support, plus a grant from the OHA and some of our own funds, we created the Lilac Garden Walk, adding about 20 more varieties that are good for our area and bloom at different times in early summer. We already had some very large Preston lilacs. You'll notice that one of them is as tall as the light on, uh, on the back of George Street. And now that the others are maturing, we have an abundance of flowers and fragrance fills the air in early summer. Encouraged by our success, we undertook our next project, the Wildlife Habitat Garden. This native plant demonstration garden was made possible by grants from the TD Friends of the Environment Foundation, the Georgian Bay Biosphere, our own funds, and all, as always, the support of the town of Perry Sound. The site we chose for the garden was provided by an insect pest. The death and removal, and removal of many of the red pine trees planted in the original plantation pro provided a blank canvas. And the biosphere had already planted a tiny, Wait, <laughs> the biosphere had already planted a tiny example in the circular bed across from the entrance to the museum to get us started. We had a big plant order delivered in an, in an even bigger truck and got to work. A lot of people think that native plants don't have pretty flowers, but I disagree. The garden has already been proven to be a place for people to gather for a book reading in a shady spot, for a strawberry social under a big tent, and for vendors to set up along the driveway during events like garden days at Tower Hill. Tower Garden Days was an all day community event in partnership with the Horticultural Society, supported by the Rotary Club, hence the big tent, and as always, the town. We had speakers, workshops, a flower show, plant sale, and vendors. And we also had ceremonies to acknowledge the contributions to the wildlife habitat garden and to unveil this later lilac collection. We attracted people of all ages and luckily the weather was perfect both years we held the event. Our most recent and most ambitious project is the creation of a children's garden at Tower Hill. A children's garden is neither a playground nor an outdoor classroom, but it is a magical place to inspire the imagination and explore nature. As lovely as it is, Tower Hill is not that place. Once they have climbed the tower and checked out the pond, children are ready to move on. It's an idea I've had for a long time that didn't get gifted this picnic table by the com compassionate friends in memory of lost children. I knew exactly where I wanted it. Tucked in behind the time capsule, people must have wondered why it was there, but the stepping stones leading to it and the path through the periwinkle behind it lead through the woods around the back of the tower to these child-sized steps. I always envisioned the garden would have two components. This more open but largely used unused area would be more of a flower filled space where people, especially children could gather for events such as storytelling and learning. The paths and natural rocky topography in the woods would be for exploring and free play. I put together a presentation and pitched the idea to our group, the master gardeners, and more importantly, to April McNamara. April grew up in town, played and explored at Tower Hill and brought children there as a playground supervisor. As manager of parks and recreation, she loved the idea and gave us the green light. We, we began in earnest last year by building this little wooden footbridge over a wet area that invites exploration. We decided to create a butterfly garden in the gathering space, an idea that was embraced by Nora Alexander, who secured a donation from the retired teachers of Ontario to fund that space. It not only paid for the plants we planted in July and then had to water for the rest of the summer, but it also paid for two small butterfly branches fabricated by a fellow named Woody Farrell in Lakefield. My husband and I hooked up our faithful trailer and picked them up one day in October. 
I came across a listing on the buy and sell for some primitive but hefty log furniture. Not only did the seller agree to donate them to the garden, but he owns Tallman Tree Service and delivered them. It took some work to get them into place, but now we have a nice spot to sit in the woods. This year has been mostly about work, not buying or building things. We have almost completed the network of paths that wind through the woods below most of the garden. The children's garden will be an ongoing project and we will seek funding as the plan develops. No matter what big or little project we are working on, we wrap up our season the same way every year and invite you to swing by one evening and enjoy the lights. Many, many people tell us that we should light up the tower. I recently posted on social media that I think we have 10 more years in us. And as an ever-changing group, I think we do. But what about me, the ringleader, as I'm affectionately called? Today, I am as happy to embrace the garden as I was that first day when this photo was taken. Over time, I have learned to be a better leader and some of the longtime gardeners have taken responsibility for different areas. But I am still the leader and my shadow can be found in the garden more than anyone else's. I'm not very good at keeping track of my administrative hours, but I do put in more volunteer hours not gardening than gardening. And although the gardeners are enthusiastic, there is not one who is willing to step into my shoes. How many more years do I have in me as a leader? I would say, I'd like to say 10. I optimistically would say five, but life doesn't always go as planned. The future of the Tower Hill Gardeners is in your hands. Do you have someone who would be willing to assume my role leading volunteers, managing the website, blogging and posting on social media, making planting plans and planning events. That is how most public gardens operate, a small staff with volunteer support. That is how you can secure the future of Tower Hill Heritage Garden and protect this amazing and unique natural and cultural asset. You already have that person on staff. Ask me who she is and I will tell you Ask me if I will mentor her and I will say yes with open arms. Thank you. Thanks. It is Any questions? Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to know who it is? Her name is Samantha and um, Adamson and she planned and planted your butterfly garden and she would be so happy to spend Tuesday mornings with us and learn everything that I do. She can post, she can blog, she can manage the website, she can do all those things. And when I am on, not, no longer with us, <laughs> she, it, it would be great. It would re really be great if you folks could join in at a, at a higher level than you do now. And believe me, you are there. And it's been unbelievable the support that we have and we get, and um, I'm appreciative and happy to put in another 10 years. Thanks, Anne. Uh, uh, Councillor McCann. I'm optimistically sure that you have another 20 years in you, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm Good. kind of invested in my own property. Yeah. Here, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you're to be uh, commended for that. I, I know what volunteering is all about and, and this town wouldn't or any town wouldn't get by without the countless hours that people put in and it's those that look at the amount of work and not the time on the clock that get the job done so what can the town do to in terms of assisting or encouraging uh, this lady to get involved or to fill in your shoes give her boss enough uh, enough funding that she can hire someone to do to pick up the garbage so Sam can spend more time in the gardens and she is a certified and trained horticulturist and that is her love and I think that you have plans for more gardens and more improvements along the waterfront and so on and so on and uh, in horticulture and planning that sort of plantings and maintaining them is something that uh, may become important. Well, Mr. Mayor, if we can get a seconder, I'd like to move that we uh, put this in the budget for next year. Uh, Councilor McCann, I think there's a staffing issue that needs to be discussed as well. Yeah. Without budgeting first, mm -hmm. we can talk about it, but her director's sitting over there right now, and I, 
I think it's okay. It's really right. up to it's really up to the budgeting process and the staffing. It's process. another another discussion. So I think he's heard well what uh, what's been said. Good. Thank you. And I think he has a connection to Tower Hill too. <laughs> Okay, any other questions for Ann? No? Okay, thank you. Rebecca, I appreciate you me, what you're doing. Do you want me to save a copy to the desktop? Please. Okay. Okay, just go for something. it. <clears throat> thank you, Rick. Um, just something my uh, family has noticed over the years. Um, and my son has asked before, what, what happened to the goldfish uh, in the pond over the winter time? Well, Usually I have a, I have thousands of pictures and I can only talk for 10 minutes. So I have to cut them out. But there is a cave that is just on the, just it's close to the center of, of the pond near the fountain. And it drops, it, there's an entrance that's about this big. If you, you're walking around, you step in it, you're up to your neck. But the fish go in there. Uh, in the winter time, and it, the water doesn't uh, doesn't freeze in there. And Bob Nixie, I'm sure some of you will remember Bob Nixie. He told me that when he was working for Public Works and they were pumping out the pond frequently, that one time he stuck the fire pump in the cave and let the pump pump for 20 minutes, and the water level never went down, which tells you there's some interesting aquifers in that area and unsurprisingly when the museum put in their uh, heat pump you know hvac system that required well the heat exchangers they had no problem getting water on the top of the hill in perry sound it's just the way it is it's our secret we're going to hold on to it <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a while since i used a pc so maybe yeah, just just to save it to the desktop. Yeah, that one council update. Okay. Thanks very much. Come and see us sometime. All right. Uh, that are the, those are the deputations for tonight. So it's uh, reports, and we'll start with uh, Councillor Belusky. Yep. Nothing. Okay. All right. Hey, Councillor Keith. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, fellow councillors, uh, staff, and the public. I attended the Provincial Offenses Advisory Committee meeting, and in, uh, it, we were reviewing um, the stats from the uh, last um, uh, some, last six months, and basically we're really in line with the rest of the province in that tickets issuing issuance is down. Uh, therefore, revenues are down. However, um, as I indicated, that um, we're about the same as the rest of the province. The draft budget was approved uh, for the next uh, year, 2023. Uh, in reviewing also the stats, it is noted, noted, but again, you're actually ahead of the game. Although there is roughly unfortunately about one and a half million defaulted fines uh, and that when you first hear it is really concerning however again when you review throughout the province you learn that we are ahead of the game in trying to collect defaulted fines and part of the problem is to do with legislation so we are at least looking at now um, is it possible for alternatives of when the property oh, when somebody has a fine if they're the sole property owner that there can be uh, a lien against the taxes there as well as uh, 
guaranteement. So this is something we are looking at. Many other municipalities are in the same boat. So really the bottom line is we are um, doing the best we can. And at the same time, we're looking at another alternative, which is has been used in, in a few municipalities, which again has to do with the administering, the administering of park it, parking tickets. And we're looking at this administrative uh, monetary penalty system. And uh, as I've said, we're going to try a pilot project to see if this would be feasible for our community. And therefore, I'll be able to uh, report, assuming I'm appointed back to the committee, report back hopefully at the next meeting in May to give a better better idea as to whether this will be feasible for our community to see how well it can work. And again, if we are able to um, uh, end up having being able to collect more fines. And so the revenue therefore increases. So this is just the reality of what situation is throughout the province. Um, I also attended just for interest sake, um, the light up the park that went very well. And I have to say there has been a lot of, of citizens um, in the community who were really impressed with all the work that was done uh, this year at the park. There was some real ingenuity. And I understand that uh, Joel Prophet from the water plant did the creation and welding of the joy, the word joy. And it's just a beautiful what was done there. We have real creativity within our own uh, municipality, within our own employees. And sometimes I think until you see something like this, you may not recognize how valuable our employees are and how creative they are. It, it was just the display, if you go by still, it was, it's just really awesome what has been done this year. Frankly, I heard no negative comments and that's surprising because usually there's somebody who, uh, can, who also has to suggest how we could do better. So it was wonderful there. Um, I helped decorate uh, the float for the Santa Claus parade and as would be my case, I was also on it jumping about. Um, I also attended the uh, Radiothon for Salvation Army. I did that uh, two evenings. And it certainly, again, shows the number of people and how generous people are in our community. I don't have the very final um, uh, amount that was raised, but I know at the end of the second day on the Friday there, we were getting close to 30,000. And I think that's remarkable in a community uh, and in this area. And it shows how people, whether in Perry Sound or outside of Perry Sound, pull together for that. And the uh, last thing I did also was I attended uh, last evening the drop-in, which is for youth 12 and up. Again, a number of volunteers there, a number of people who have made financial donations to make that work in our community right there downtown, which uh, of course is open on Tuesdays and Thursdays and I understand once a, once a month on Fridays. There will also be the opportunity of a movie for youth to go and watch. But it's such a, a lovely uh, inside the building. It's colorful. There's a variety of activities that go back to physical activities and board games and ping pong, uh, not, not um, uh, merely a video game, something where people are required to participate and socialize. So I think that is a, a really great thing. So that's my report and thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, it seems like um, Bonnie and I uh, crossed paths a few times. Um, I helped decorate uh, uh, the floats uh, with some of the town staff as well for the Christmas, uh, for the Santa Claus parade. Um, and um, yeah, it's great, uh, great to see the parade back in action in full swing and a uh, great turnout uh, uh, for the people. Um, also attended the uh, the opening, grand opening for the drop uh, last night and uh, was blown away by the facility. I didn't realize they had so much space, particularly in the downstairs where there's 
a nice rec room. They have a ping pong table and air hockey table. Uh, so I think that's a very um, valuable asset for our community, for the youth um, from ages 12 to 20. And I hope a lot of them utilize it, um, that need that space. Um, I attended the uh, grand opening of the Best Western um, and um, got a tour of there. This was the second time I've had the tour. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a great facility. It's nice to see it's in a high profile area as well. And I think they'll do quite well there. Um, and uh, Radiothon, I attended the, uh, I was, did a little bit of a challenge to some of our municipal uh, people uh, to, to match the donation at the Radiothon. Um, so yeah, that's what I've been up to recently. Okay, thank you, Council McCann. Uh, thank you, good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, fellow councillors and staff and public. Uh, Santa Claus Parade has been mentioned. I had an opportunity to uh, participate, uh, although I, I didn't benefit from being next to uh, jumping uh, Councillor Keith this time around. I got to drive that big, funny looking red, what we call MV1 uh, van from Community Support Services, which is so funny and ugly looking it's 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 cute <laughs> anyhow i got to ride that in the parade and uh, staff and volunteers followed along uh, so and congratulations to everyone who was in the parade you know when you're uh, it was nice to to get back to the real thing and um, something i discovered you're sitting and you're driving and you're looking out the window and you, know, you wave to people and you say Merry Christmas and it just gets you in your heart when you hear the crowd or the kids, uh, you know, uh, return the compliment. It's just, it was a, I think we were all ready for all uh, definitely ready and overdue for a, for a nice uh, celebration. So thank you to the, uh, the folks that put all that together. And uh, I as well attended the Best Western Plus Grand Opening Monday evening, the 28th. The, uh, of course, it's on uh, uh, Pine Drive. I guess that's the official address. Uh, and, and it is a beautiful establishment. It's so bright, modern, clean looking. I know it's a new building, but uh, it's just something about it that I've never seen in other hotels and motels. It's just very welcoming. The staff were uh, friendly. They made us uh, feel welcome. And uh, I too got the grand tour, everything from the boiler room uh, right up to the top floor. And uh, the rooms are beautiful. The uh, bathrooms have modern fixtures. It's quite something. Um, also, uh, we had a special council meeting last week, which uh, I attended. And even though I've been at this for eight years, I always have something to learn. So it was a good refresher as there was a bit of a training involved and in refreshing for uh, new and uh, new council members and uh, incumbents. So thank you to staff for preparing that for us uh, last week. And uh, there's one more thing I want to uh, mentioned just as a reminder to folks um, I think everybody knows that our local theater has been sold uh, my uh, the Strand Theater I understand the new owners uh, are looking to um, redevelop it as some sort of a, a theater uh, I haven't heard anything official but in the meantime there's no real big screen in town unless you have your own big screen tv at home so I want to remind people to uh, consider the uh, the stocky center in the movies that are played there um, week in and week out. My wife and I have attended a few of them. The last one was the uh, documentary on Leonard Cohen. And I learned some things about it. It, it. It's just, it's nice to have that alternative and to go, you can eat popcorn while you're watching and you can drink. Uh, so it uh, consider that if you're looking for an evening to get out an excuse, uh, take in one of the movies that are showing there. The tickets, I believe, are $12 each. Very reasonable this time. And so just consider that. And that is my report. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Ashford? No report today. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Councilor Borneman? This will be quick. Uh, the parade, light up the park, the drop, and the best western have been mentioned. Uh, good luck, especially to the folks at the drop, and congratulations uh, to the organizers of the parade and light up the park. Councillor Keith mentioned the radiothon. I, I think I topped the list. I took in over ten thousand bucks in a couple of hours. So I'll put that <laughs> challenge out to out to the uh, phone answers for next year. 
but the the radiothon <laughs> is really just the tip of the 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 iceberg your worship uh various food drives by opp and mnr staffs uh donations from uh various community organizations and private sector uh, firms and individuals um uh, i'm sure far exceed the the monies that were generated at the uh radiothon um our community truly is uh great at giving especially this time of year i guess i'd only add in closing and that it's never too late um i'm sure that uh the many organizations that need help would uh, gladly accept uh, your donation up until christmas i'll leave it at that for this evening all right thank you thank you uh council staff and public november 18th as was mentioned was light up the park uh, and the Salvation Army Kettle Kickoff. Um, the numbers of people out there were absolutely amazing. It was it was wonderful. The library had a story time for Santa, and Santa told me that he actually they had to actually do story time twice because uh, there were so many numbers of kids that they couldn't fit them all in at one time. So, um, Salvation Army provided hot chocolate, and our staff really lit up the park it was amazing the efforts that they put into that so thank you to our town staff all their efforts and thank you to the volunteers that helped support the event november 24th and 25th they attended amo meetings in toronto number november 26th as was mentioned also the santa claus parade and i want to thank our town staff again for organizing and volunteering for the event and thank you to all the people who volunteered and participated certainly well done and again, it was really great to see the solid numbers of people out at the different corners and along the way. I mean, it was it was amazing. Uh, as was mentioned as well, November 28th I, at 6 p.m., I attended the official opening of the Best Western Hotel. Very well-appointed hotel with very comfortable rooms. I'd like to thank Michael, Devin, and Brienne for their hospitality for the event. Uh, they were very, very hospitable to everybody that was there, and I have to thank them for that. Uh, November 30th was the CP holiday train. And again, what a packed event, an amazing crowd. Um, thank you to Canadian Pacific for supporting food banks. They presented a check for $7,000 to Harvest Share, and this is CP's 24th year in supporting food banks. The concert performers were Tennille Towns and Eshinabi, and they certainly did a fantastic performance. Thank you to Engel and Volkers for providing hot chocolate and the Festival of the Sound for, for providing some mus music and a warm place for people to go. A uh, big thank you has to go to Harvest Share for all their work that they do throughout the year, helping to put uh, food on tables. And thank you to their volunteers. Uh, and to all those people that came out to watch and donate food and monetary donation, the vehicles were quite full. So that was really good. Um, De December 1st and 2nd, Moose FM Radiothon, it's been mentioned. Um, they were able to raise $29,418, so well done for, for that. So thank you to Moose mm -hmm. FM, the Salvation Army, for their efforts, and thank you to all those that donated. It's greatly appreciated. Um, as was mentioned, we it is very proud to be able to represent a community in an area of so many giving people that realize that that they want to support people that are less fortunate than themselves and that are struggling to day to day. So it is very much appreciated. Everyone that has donated in some shape or form um, to the Salvation Army, uh, the Harvest Share, and um, you know even even Rotary for the turkey dinners that. Uh, Rotary puts together with, I think, No Frills and some of the other organizations that, um, you know, put food on the table for people at Christmas time. And you know, Councillor Borderman mentioned, you know, some of the others that are out there, you know, volunteering, the ambulance attendants, the police, and conservation officers that were collecting food or whatever. So um, it, it's just, it's just very heartwarming that, that, people pitch in and do that. 
Um, December 4th uh, was a fundraiser at uh, Trussell Brewery. The event was to help raise funds for Rotary to support their efforts in supporting the Ukrainians that have located here. And I certainly have to thank Rotary for their efforts in this. Uh, December 5th at 9 a.m. I was on hand for the official opening of Oak Crest Bistro and Bake Shop where Lil's used to be. And December, and again, later in the evenings uh, after six, the opening of the drop youth counseling. And this as Councillor Keith described as a safe place for the youth in our community uh, to go and talk, be active, but certainly feel safe in a safe environment. So anyway, that's my report. A uh, fair bit going on, which is really, really good. So on with the agenda. So moved by Councillor McDonald, second by Councillor Keith, that within the terms of reference to the Waterfront Advisory Committee as adopted by resolution 2021, 097, the number of voting citizens appointees be increased from five to seven. Any further, any discussion on that? Councillor McCann? I, I think maybe just uh, for the public's benefit, maybe we could uh, uh, suggest, or maybe uh, Councillor uh, uh, George would like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's been a long day. Uh, Ashford would like to uh, to comment on because uh, he had a suggestion for the waterfront committee. Uh, certainly, if it's uh, acceptable to you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor or Mayor, sorry. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, Doug. I just think uh, it's a great opportunity. A lot of people put their names forward, and we can uh, benefit from. Uh, a greater representation of all the different people in Perry Sound. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Anything further? No. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Moved by. Councillor Bolesky, seconded by Councillor Keith, that Council hereby approves citizen lay appointments to various boards, commissions, and committees as identified in Schedule A attached. Discussion? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. I would like to thank all of those people that sent in their resumes or CVs to um, take part on these various committees and boards. Moved by Councillor Keith and seconded by Councillor Bolesky that Council hereby approves consent application B22-15 at 37 Joseph Street in order to facilitate a lot addition in favor of the adjacent parcel to the east subject to the conditions outlined in Schedule A. And Mr. Ran, during the um, public meeting that we had. Um, it was suggested that there were some things that needed to be done or uh, a concern from an adjacent property. Where, what's, what's your recommendation on this? To your worship, um, there, was, there were some concerns expressed by the neighboring property owner to the south. Um, staff have, have had several discussions with the property owner. Um, uh, we, we feel that the application is a fairly straightforward one. Um, there may have been some uh, confusion with respect to the lot, exact lot line locations on the aerial photo. However, staff are recommending as a condition of consent that the um, severed lands be uh, surveyed. Um, we can certainly beef that condition up should uh, council uh, want something additional in there, uh, such as tying a on the ground monument or uh, the location of the driveway um, to give a uh, level of comfort that that's sort of taken care of. Uh, I, I do believe that the the neighbor um, uh, just had some concerns again with respect to the location and she feels that you know it may be misrepresented. However, uh, we do have additional drawings and we can show council on a, on a survey uh, and give council a better idea of where where the uh, uh, lot to be severed is if 
if council wishes. Do do we need to uh, postpone this at all for um, to do the other other items? To you, your worship, um, council could uh, amend the conditions if 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 so desired, but staff uh, would recommend that a decision on the application be made tonight. Um, again, uh, staff are, have a fairly good level of comfort that the um, application as submitted is appropriate and um, the exact location again would be uh, determined by way of a survey. Now, is there anything that's missing in this, is it the survey? to your worship in uh, within the recommend uh, within the recommended conditions number two does refer to a set of drawing files um, actually number one and two and three really all have to do with with that survey and property description um, I would suggest that uh, if council would like to put additional wording in that we would amend condition number one um, to show the location of the driveway on that survey plan. Council McCann. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wren, for the, your report. Um, yeah, I spent some time looking at this this afternoon and talking to the property owner and actually attended the site there today. Uh, I had some concerns, but I think you put them to rest. Uh, but just to just to review what we, we know, I, I think it, it, it's all hinging on the fact that there's some uncertainty as to the exact position of the property markers. And uh, that uh, provision will be satisfied with the uh, survey that the uh, person putting forth this, this request will have to take care of. So at some point, nothing gets done until we know exactly where the property lines sit. Because I believe from, from some of the drawings and from what we saw, it kind of looked like maybe the uh, additional property that was being handed over uh, or passed over to 153 uh, Gibson uh, might have actually gone in front of their property rather than 153s. Uh, so I'm satisfied that the um, um, th that the conditions will will be a safe haven for the property owner. I I don't know if if you, Mr. Mayor, you mentioned about making putting more wording in that first one. Is is you, is that necessary? Do you think or? Um, uh, through your worship to Councillor McCann, I, I don't think it's necessary unless um, this unless council feels that they need an additional check and balance put into the condition, and staff have no issue doing that. But uh, again, I would stress it's certainly not necessary, as we would evaluate um, any draft surveys that would come in and ensure that they are accurate and um, represent what was actually applied for. Okay. So just as a final follow-up, I was going to ask to have this deferred this evening, but the the, uh, the, uh, the the I guess the goal remains is to do the survey to figure out where the lines are. And the only way to get that done is to move forward with this tonight uh, so that the uh, uh, one who's putting in the application can move forward then with, with an official survey, uh, which will be done. And then uh, we can go from there. And then the property owner uh, will be... Uh, safe and, and satisfied then that certainly makes me feel better councillor ashford it, it, in addition to what doug was saying there just from looking at it and hearing the the person's concerns um if a survey is being done um can we not ask that the mo a monument be set if one's not already there it looks like the the southwest uh, corner of 153 gibson street would be the monument in question Does that does that seem reasonable? Um, it would be. I would presume it looks like one fifty three would be purchasing the property from uh, Hassel Holdings. From what I can tell, is that it? It'd be an extra maybe extra hundred bucks for a monument or something. It, does that seem reasonable to everyone? Um, through you, Your Worship, um, we could. I don't know about monuments and whether or not that's something we could require in a survey. Obviously, the surveyor would need to either reference uh, sur survey monuments on the ground or install new ones. Um, however, we could ask that the driveway in question be shown on the survey. 
Okay. All right. Perfect. Okay. It, that seems good to me if that's reasonable to everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Councilor McCann, I'll go back to you after uh, Councilor Bolesky has a question. Well, thank you, Your Worship. I, I, I think it's going to end with this the conditions you put to it that the jury or the amendment said satisfies the one on the Yeah. And that way it doesn't have to come back. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, yeah, just a, a follow up then. And so, uh, yeah, the property owner believes that 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 marker is in the possibly in the middle of that driveway there, which seems to straddle the property line, the official property line. Whether the marker's still there or not, there's been some gravel that's been uh, done on that driveway. Uh, so I think the the survey should hopefully either find the marker that's there or put one or wherever it belongs. So that's a bit of confusion here in the soup here. Is there any additional wording we do you think we need to do to cover any of that, or is that going to be sufficient what's in here? Um, through you or to you, Your Worship, um, in order to amend the resolution, we I think we need a motion. Yeah. Um, so I, I would recommend something along the lines of uh, adding to the end of number one to include. Um, I don't know, uh, to show the existing driveway location. The existing or the new? Sorry, to include the existing driveway location. Yeah, you want to, you want to just from the converse from the conversation and the suggestions is is a wording to item one conditional that location of the drive would be shown on the survey. Um, through your worship, um, uh, yeah, um, I do believe that that that's probably even more straightforward. We could even add a, a condition number eight um, that would just simply say that that the driveway be shown on the reference plan. As as a new item, as a new a number, correct a number eight. Thing. Yeah. Okay. You got that. Okay. We we'll need a mover and seconder for Councillor Keith, Councillor Bolesky. Um, any comment on on that? No. All in favor then? That's carried. Okay. Uh, you're good then? Okay, all right. Any further comment on the uh, resolution as amended? When would we ac actually go ahead with, uh, when does this move? Uh, would the property owner be, uh, the applicant be putting forth the survey within foreseeable time? Uh, through your worship to Councillor McCann, the applicant would have two years to fulfill any conditions. So, um, it'd really be up to the applicant to ensure that it's done within the two years. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else? All in favor? That's carried, thank you. It is. Moved by Councilor Keith, seconded by Councilor Bolesky. Council hereby approves consent application B2205 in order to facilitate the creation of one severed and one retained lot subject to the conditions outlined in Schedule A. Any discussion? No. Mr. Rand, do you have anything you want to add? I do not have anything further. However, uh, if Council has any questions, we're certainly here to answer those. I don't see any, so. All in favor then? That's carried. Okay, moved by Councillor Keith and seconded by Councillor Bolesky that upon the recommendation of the EMS Advisory Committee, the 2023 Land Ambulance Operating Budget be approved with a 5% levy increase over the 2022 approved budget and a total amount 
of uh, $12,292,095.27 and that the land ambulance capital budget be approved in the amount of a capital budget be approved in the amount of 595,000 to be funded from the EMS capital reserve fund. Mr. Thompson, you got anything you wanna add to? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the um, uh, the budget is, is outlined fairly comprehensively in the report. I would add that this has been to the EMS Advisory Committee, and uh, there was a robust discussion about uh, many of the, uh, the enhancements and the issues surrounding the budget. Uh, the EMS Advisory Committee did uh, 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 do want to recommend that this budget move forward to Town Council as presented. Any questions, comments? No. Council Bornman, do you have your hand up? Oh, okay. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm wondering if Mr. Thompson would uh, just give the public uh, in Perry Sound an indication what the impact is on the town's uh, levy here. <clears throat> There are a lot of big numbers tossed around in here. Not everyone has access to the entire report. Through you, Mr. Mayor. I'm um, so the impact is 5% of the town's levy. The town pays based upon weighted assessment, uh, as all municipalities do, towards this levy. This levy is for the entire district of Perry Sound, so it takes into account all the weighted assessments for the entire district and then divides it up by the uh, percentage allocated to each municipality. I'm dragging this out a little bit so that my peer beside me can quickly do the math. <laughs> um, and she's almost on it right now. The uh, Perry Sound levy is about 8% of the entire um, portion of the, um, of the municipal levy. Again, I also want to uh, advise everyone that the province is supposed to pick up 50% of land ambulance costs. Sure. It never actually works out to that because they're always one year behind. So generally the municipalities are picking up 52 to 55. If you want to say the number, that'd be wonderful. Yes, sure. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So the impact to the town's portion, if the weighted assessment r remains like relatively the same, would be close to 14,000. So that so 1% is about uh, 120,000 or around there. So 14,000 of 120,000. So it's uh, uh, 12%, like 0 0.12 of your tax bill. So it's okay. less than 0 0.2. So to to the councillor's question, it's 0.12% of the tax rate. Right. That's only for the town of Perry Sound. Right. I just want to be yep. clear about that. Every municipality is going to be different based upon what their tax rates are for their municipalities. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Any other questions? All in favor then? And that's carried. Thank you. Moved by Council McCann, seconded by Councillor Keith, that Council hereby approves appointments of members of Council and staff to various boards, commissions, and committees identified in Schedule A attached. Any discussion? Councillor Keith? Yes, I would just say in reference to the appointment of one of the boards that I've been appointed to, um, it, I noticed that in brackets, it still says CPAC. And uh, I think that's really important for people to be aware that although we're changing the title at this point, 
the board is still acting as a police advisory committee board because those things have not happened just right. for clarity. Very good. Any other questions? No. Nope. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Moved by Council McDonald, the second by Council McCann, the Council hereby approves the renewal of the Corporation's General Insurance and risk management services with BFL Canada at a the premium at the premium of up to six hundred and forty seven thousand two hundred and sixty seven dollars plus tax for the one year period ending December fifteenth, two thousand and twenty three. Any discussion? All in favor? That's carried. Moved by Councilor McDonald, second by Councilor McCann, the bylaw number 2022-7291 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement with the West Perry Sound Health Center for the provision of fire dispatch services be considered as read a first time. All in favor? That's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? That's carried. Moved by Councilor McCann, second by Councilor McDonald, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time passed, signed and sealed. Any discussion? All in favor? That's carried. You all have other signatures later. by Councillor McDonald, second by Councillor McCann. That bylaw number 2022-7292 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 2004-4653, the zoning bylaw as amended to remove a holding provision H symbol from part of lots 11 and 12 west side of Forest Street, plan 21 and part one, plan 42R 9872 and part of lot one and three, plan 42R uh, 8176 in the town of Perry Sound be considered as read a first time. All in favor? That's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? That's carried. Moved by Council McCann and second by Council McDonald. The bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? Council McCann. Yes, thank you. This would be. Uh... For Mr. Brand, I guess. Um, so lifting the holding provision, uh, that sounds to me like uh, the uh, project is coming along and is satisfactory to the uh, site plans and such. Uh, for the general public, what does this, what are we, could you just inform them as to what we're doing and what, at this stage? Through your worship to uh, Councillor McCann, um, holding provisions in a nutshell are tools that are used by municipalities to ensure that certain, um, it's almost conditional. We don't like to use that term in, in planning for zoning, um, but it's almost, uh, it's almost conditional on certain things happening prior to a building permit being issued. So in this particular instance, um, there were two uh, provisions uh, within that holding that needed to be met. Uh, one was that a site plan agreement be um, finalized and then two um, that the lots which are three separate lots or were three separate lots um, merge on title so both of those conditions have been met um, so once the holding is lifted and the site plans finalized then a building permit can be issued so in this case the um, site plan has been executed and is uh, soon to be registered on title and once that's registered on title a building permit could be issued subject to all the appropriate information being submitted to the building department. Great, thank you. Any other questions? All in favor then? That's carried, thank you. Thank 
jokes. Okay. Yeah. Move by Council in Cannes, second by Councillor Keith, that bylaw number 2022-7295 being a bylaw to use GFA as the basis for calculating the water and wastewater fee for commercial industrial applications effective with the first commercial industrial application processed under bylaw 2022-7251 be considered as read a first time. All in favor? And that's carried. Members in favor of having the second and third readings? Carried Moved by Councillor Keith, second by Councillor McCann. The bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Discussion. There. Councillor Keith. Yes, could Mr. Harris, I take it, to explain what's going on here so, to the public, please? Thank you. Uh, certainly, through you, uh, Mr. Bear. The uh, the town in the spring of uh, 2022 amended our fees and charges bylaw. There was a bylaw in place. We amended it to uh, change the fees and uh, Tatham Engineering helped us develop the fee structure that was more appropriate. Uh, the cost uh, to for development was more appropriate in line with our costs. In doing that, um, we were also aware that we were working on implementing a development charges bylaw. This was uh, in some ways an interim measure. Uh, we thought it was appropriate to collect these charges uh, and the more development that contributes to the charge, it keeps the overall charge down. Um, as we approached this uh, fall, we're nearing, excuse me, we're nearing um, the point where we're going to release the development charges document in draft form for the public comment. The fees and charges for commercial industrial properties in the fees and charges bylaw is based on the greater of GFA, gross floor area, or flows. In the proposed, excuse me, in the draft development charges bylaw, the charge for water and sewer, uh, wastewater is just based on GFA. So, and that is the recommendation from the consultants working on the development charges background study, and that's pretty much the norm in the industry. So we thought it appropriate to recommend to change the calculation of the fees and charges bylaw to the same methodology is going to be proposed in the next few months to the development charges based on the development charges bylaw. Because there's going to be a transition from the fees and charges to development charges. And having that uh, common methodology for the calculation to change it now makes sense. Uh, at the time of this uh, discussion and, and in thinking about how we bring this forward to council, uh, we had three potential commercial industrial applications uh, that were in the process were wanting building permits. We've issued a lot of residential permits since the uh, fees and charges was put in place. But we've only had those three applications that were eminent, and one of those three, the uh, building permit was actually issued. They had some timing concerns. And so part of what this uh, recommendation is, is let's uh, not create a, a transition issue where we're going to be charging commercial industrial uh, payers, calculating based on a method that's going to change in a few months. There, And let's be consistent in that methodology and starting now. Councillor Keith, you have... Yes, my follow-up is, so the methodology that is being proposed, is that the same or similar method, methodology that is being proposed in other communities? So we're basically consistent or are we reinventing the wheel? Uh, through the mayor. No, it's, it's consistent. The, the norm for DCs is GFA. And we're proposing that the fees and charges move to GFA now rather than having some applications based on flows and then change the GFA in a few months. Let's do it now and apply to all the commercial industrial applications so there's consistency. Yeah. Okay. 
but what I'm hearing is this is a similar sort of thing that goes on in other yeah. municipalities. Oh, That's what absolutely. I'm getting at, absolutely. right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Barnard. So, I, Mr. Harris and I have struck, discussed this earlier. I struggle with this because we're going th through development charges and we're, uh, you know, we're required to do certain things in order to implement those. So I just want to make sure, Mr. Harris, that, you know, that upgrading the original bylaw or changing the original bylaw was vetted by a lawyer and what we're doing isn't putting us in any position of liability going forward. I have a couple more questions after that, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Uh, sure, through the mayor. In the spring of, uh, of this year, we met with, um, with uh, our lawyer, who was uh, Russell Christie, and uh, the firm of Russell Christie. And we knew we were trying to treat all developments, you know, have a level playing for it, field for everybody. And so we, we knew it was going to take a number of months before we got a development charges bylaw in place. So we thought, what might we do? And it was actually... Uh, their recommendation or their request, do you have a fees and charges bylaw in place today? We said, yes. Uh, so they, they said, work within that framework that already exists. And that's what we've done. And, and that conversation, that suggestion actually came from uh, Russell Christie. Thank you. Uh, secondly, you, I think you said uh, uh, in answering Councillor Keith's question that one building permit in this, uh, you know, commercial sector had been issued uh, during the time that that the bylaw that we're amending tonight was in place. Is that correct? That that only one building permit had been issued under the this this framework. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, through the mayor, that's correct. There's there's two that were sort of a not ready to be issued, but in the works and potentially could have been issued, but only one was issued. So I, I would assume then that in order to be fair and consistent that um, the fees and charges that were levied in that one instant would be revisited and dealt with in a manner consistent with what is proposed. Uh, through the mayor, that's, that's the intent of the way the report is written and the attached bylaw so that uh, by timing of a week or two, you know, there's not a big difference in how uh, uh, development would be treated. They'd be treated the same. Okay. That that's important. I think we owe those folks a bit of an apology, but the, my final question is none of this impacts on, or there are no impacts from any of this on residential development or any of the permits that were issued in that in that sector through the uh, the framework of the this bylaw? Uh, through the mayor, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? All in favor? Well, it's carried, thank you. Moved by Councillor Bolesky, second by Councillor Keith, that bylaw number 2022-72 to 97 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 2004-4653, the zoning bylaw, as amended to remove a holding provision H from part of mill block A and part of original shore road allowance being parts 1 to 3 plan 42R2299 in the town of Perry Sound be considered as read a first time. All in favor? That's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? Carried. Moved by Councillor Keith, second by Councillor Bolesky. Let the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? Councillor McCann? I'm ensuring that Mr. Rand is earning his money tonight. <laughs> uh, again, can you explain uh, 
what's happening here and this uh, piece of property. Thank you, Worship, to Councillor McCann, um, or through you, Worship, rather. In this case, uh, very similar to the, the previous holding provision um, in that we're very close to finalizing a site plan agreement. And uh, there's a formality to remove this holding provision. In this case, the holding provision was required to ensure that adequate access was provided to the site and staff are um, satisfied that uh, that uh, uh, condition has been met. Um, so staff are recommending that the holding uh, be removed in order uh, for the applicant to proceed with the site plan agreement. Great, thank you. Councilor Ashford. Uh, hi, um, uh, Mr. Rand. I, I, I apologize. I'm, I might just with uh, us kind of starting off. I haven't seen the uh, site plan for this particular property. Is there one that's been circulated or? Um, through you, Your Worship, to Councillor Ashford. Um, I, I guess historically, site plan agreements would have been evaluated and and. Uh, approved by council. However, through recent planning act changes, um, it's now a staff delegated approval uh, for site plan agreements. I do have a drawing available if, if council would like to see it uh, just out of interest. However, um, the reason it was not circulated to council, um, it would have been, sorry, it would have been circulated to council once it was originally submitted. However, it's not brought up as an agenda item for approval as it's a staff approval. I'm just looking at it and uh, I can't imagine that Olive Street would be a great street to have 91 units driving through. And is, are, are we gonna be able to kind of evaluate this further as we go? I'm through your worship to Councillor Ashford. Um, the proposed entrance is actually off of Emily Street and down um, an unopened road allowance. Uh, to the development. Sorry, Kate Street. Kate Street. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't think I can speak. I don't think I could vote on this without knowing more information. Go ahead. Uh, to your worship, I can bring up the drawing uh, if council. Sure. Okay. Like, bear with me. Sorry. Councilor McCann. Uh, while he's doing that, I was just wondering, and, and, and I understand what Mr. Rand has said with the change in legislation and all, but do you think maybe perhaps it would be prudent so that uh, when this does come back for council's sign off that, uh, that we do have that as a, an immediate reference point? Well, the sign off for the site plan will be done by staff. Well, in this case, the, what we're doing here now it's just the holding provision. The holding. I'm. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you're right. Right. I guess, but I. I guess maybe still, I would still ask the same question. Any time that something comes back to us, it'd be nice to have it in the combined agenda. Well, yeah, it might have. Yeah, it's. It's more for Rebecca to do. <laughs> okay. Um, through your worship, so here is the um, uh, the plan for the access road, which would come in off of Cape Street um, down, which what is currently an un, um, an unoccupied row allowance, an un, open row allowance, and it would terminate at the uh, edge of the property. Here, there is a cul-de-sac um, proposed, and the development would be just to the south of of that um, uh, of that point. And just to add a bit more detail um, without getting too into the application, um, there is a requirement that the applicant construct this to a municipal standard. Um, it has been reviewed by uh, Public Works, our, our peer reviewer, as well as emergency services staff. So we know that um, that cul-de-sac, for example, um, is functional. Um, additionally, we would take securities in order to ensure that the road is constructed to a uh, proper municipal standard. Yeah. Okay. So, so is it Kate Street you're saying? Yes. So, will it then connect with all of the new street? 
um, through your worship. So Kate Street is here um, and the road would uh, follow this road allowance and Olive Street is somewhere in here, I believe. So Olive would connect to it as well. I don't believe that's that's the case. Um, uh, okay. Perhaps uh, Dave Thompson could Mr. provide Thompson some additional might details. Be able to answer that. And through you, Mr. Mayor, and with the help of Mr. Kearns, this was uh, this design was reviewed, and it was very clear that all of would not be connecting with it because of the there are access issues coming um, from all of onto Emily Street. So the higher levels of traffic was not appropriate in those locations. So if you know the area, know that Kate Street enters at the top of the hill and the sight lines are much more improved there. And the um, uh, through public works review, as well as through Tatham's review, that was deemed as the appropriate connection point and also to councillor's point that Olive should not connect to it so as to siphon off traffic up Olive onto Emily Street. Right. Okay, any other questions? I, I guess my final question would be where the services for water and sewer would be going. Through your worship, um, I would ask that uh, Mike Kearns answer those specifics. Um, that being said, I would just uh, note that the holding provision only relates to the access on the property. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> through your worship. So um, the servicing was also considered when we did our initial uh, review. We did actually meet on site. We walked this property. We had those exact same concerns of access uh, and the servicing would be proposed to follow that proposed road up the road, unopened road allowance up to Kate Street and out to Emily Street. Uh, and that was part of the review in terms of, in particular, dealing with uh, appropriate sanitary sewage servicing to that development as well. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Councilor Borneman? Um, just further to Councilor Ashford's uh, queries, are there concerns of any kind of traffic controls at the corner of Kate and Emily Street? Any, you know, 90 odd units, do we have any idea about traffic flows and what might be needed there in the future? Um, through your worship, I can speak generally. Um, if Mr. Kearns wants to add to that, he's more than welcome. Um, there was a traffic review done on the property, and there was a sight line uh, review done as well. Um, you can see there's these uh, sort of grade areas at the intersection, and, and that was reviewed um, for appropriateness by our peer reviewer, and uh, there were no concerns um, in that in that review. You're good. All right. Any further questions or comments? No. Uh, I just I would like to bring oh. one more comment. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to make sure that I um I'm not I just without being in the room I can't really tell. I don't want to come off as saying that the staff uh, uh, aren't doing a great job. So I just uh, I certainly didn't want to question the approvals there. It's just I didn't have the information um, available. So I'm sure everything is done in a, a proper way, and the staff are doing a great job. Uh, so I apologize if it came off uh, questioning in some way. Okay. Anything further? All in favor? That's carried. None opposed. Moved by Councillor Bluske, second by Councillor Keith, that bylaw number 2022-7293 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement with Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, accepting the terms and conditions of approval of the Bobby Orr Hall of Fame curatorial collection intern be considered as read a first time. All in favor? That's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? 
carried. Moved by Councillor Keith, second by Councillor Bolesky. That the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? All in favor then? That's carried. Moved by Councillor Keith, second by Councillor Bolesky, that bylaw number 2022-7294 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement with Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, accepting the terms and conditions of funding for the Bobby Orr Hall of Fame ex exhibition redesign project be considered as read a first time. All in favor? Carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? That's carried. Moved by Councillor Keith and second by Councillor Pulaski that the bylaw above mentioned be considered read a second and third time passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? All in favor? Now it's carried. Thank you. Good work on this, Caitlin. Thank you. Moved by Councillor McCann, second by Councillor Keith, that bylaw number 2022-7298, a bylaw for the establishment and composition of public library board be considered as read at first time. All in favor? That's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? That's carried. Moved by Councillor Keith, second by Councillor McCann, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you. Mr. Beaumont's been sitting patiently all their evening. Um, can you uh, explain what uh, what's happening here with this, please? This has nothing to do with Mr. Beaumont. I'm supposed to do with the Public Library Board. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a step ahead of myself. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you must be getting late. <laughs> Any comment on this one? All in favor, then? That's carried. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Moved by Councillor Bolesky and seconded by Councillor McCann. That bylaw number 2022-7296 being a bylaw to provide for an interim tax levy for the payment of taxes and for the penalty and interest at one and a quarter percent per month for the 2023 taxation year be considered as read at first time. All in favor? That's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? And that's carried by Councillor McCann, second by Councillor Pulaski, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read the second and third time passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? Councillor McCann. Now, now Mr. Goldman. Uh, <clears throat> through you, Your Worship, um, what this bylaw is typically is just our interim tax bylaw allowing the municipality to issue tax bills in February next year. Um, to gain, get money in uh, coming into the municipality before we do our final billing. So um, it's typical every municipality in the province does one of these. Um, it allows us, like I say, to collect money before we do our final billing before our budget's passed. And um, it allows us to charge penalty and interest for the year. Just housekeeping, basically, at this point. Uh, basically, yeah, we have to do this every year. If, if we don't do it, then we can't do the interim bill in February. We don't have that revenue coming in. So, thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions, comments? Nope. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you.
Okay, moved by Councillor <clears throat> McDonald, second by Council McCann, that bylaw number 2022-7299, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council be considered as read a first time. All in favor? Now it's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? Now it's carried. Moved by Councillor McCann, second by Councillor McDonald. That the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. All in favor? That's carried. So, prior to adjourning, I'd like to offer the following information to the public regarding the next council meeting. The next meeting of council for the town of Perry Sound is scheduled for Tuesday, December 20th at 7 p.m. The meeting will be held at the Town of Perry Sound Council Chambers at 52 Seguin Street, entrance by Gibson Street, it will be live streamed and recorded. All regular council meetings are held at 7 p.m. on the first and third Tuesday of each month, except January and August, where only one regular meeting is scheduled. Council meetings schedule notices of special council meetings, complete agendas and minutes, and instructions on accessing live streamed and recorded council meetings are all posted on the town's website. Go to www.perrysound.ca and use the search bar. Your TV airs council meetings on Saturday at 9.30 a.m. following a regular council meeting. And for Kojiko listings, contact www.yourtv.tv. Uh, as a reminder, the order of Perry Sound uh, nominations are due December the 14th and uh, that uh, please get them in as soon as possible. If you know of somebody that uh, you think would be worthy of, of the recognition that has done you know, wonderful things, which we all um, appreciate, uh, please get it in again by December the 14th and they can hand it in at the town office or email. Yep. Thank you everyone and have a good night.